Welcome to Mon uh, Science on Tap Monaqua. My name is Susan Knight. I work at the University of Wisconsin Trout Lake Station, uh, about 10 miles up the road. Science on Tap is an example of the Wisconsin idea, an idea formed in 1905 that the borders of the university are the borders of the state. We started Science on Tap not so that you could hear a lecture, but so that you could be introduced, introduced to some new ideas and then ask um, all the questions that you have on that topic. So thank you for coming. I want to remind you of our partners um, in Science on Tap, uh, where I work, University of Wisconsin, Trout Lake Station. We also have University of uh, Kemp Natural Resources Station, also part of UW-Madison. And we have the Manaqua Public Library and the Lakeland Badger Chapter of the Wisconsin Alumni Association. And of course, our hosts here, the Manaqua Brewing Company. Thanks to all those partners. And Science on Tap is brought to you mostly through uh, a grant from the Brittingham Foundation. So thanks always to them. And uh, we're having a few technical uh, problems tonight, but we are we, we're good. OK, excellent. So uh, maybe we're not having technical problems tonight. So there are four ways to watch. You can come right here, as you all are, which is, which is fantastic. Um, you can also go to the Monaco Public Library, where we have live streaming, and you can watch as well. And we also have live streaming for anyone who has an internet connection fast enough to, to pick us up. So all you have to do is go to our website and hit watch live, and you can watch from wherever you are, if you happen to be in Florida in the middle of January or wherever. And you can also watch any event later. We, we stream our entire program, uh, or we have uh, an archive of our entire program, and we also make an eight to 10 minute short of each program so that you can watch just um, sort of the highlights as well. So uh, please check us out online as well. Our next Science on Tap in May will be May 2nd, and our topic will be Wisconsin's Large Carnivores with Scott Walter, UW-Madison professor. But tonight, we are fortunate to have Dr. Hilary Dugan. Hilary grew up in southwestern Ontario, but spent her summers in northwestern Ontario on Lake of the Woods, one of the largest lakes in Ontario. Hillary says Ontario is a lot like Wisconsin, agriculture in the south and lakes and forests in the north. Her favorite memories are working summer jobs on Lake of the Woods. She'd take any odd job that required a boat. And that makes me think of, probably some of you know, um, uh, Wind in the Willows. When Rat used to say to Mole, believe me, my young friend, there is nothing, absolutely nothing, half so much worth doing as simply messing around in boats. Hillary received her undergraduate and master's degree from Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario, and her PhD from the University of Illinois, Chicago. She is now assistant professor, newly minted, at the University of Wisconsin-Madison with the Center for Limnology, part of Integrated Biology. That's formerly was zoology. So, uh, and uh, during her undergrad years, she worked as a research assistant in the Canadian Arctic, and she enjoyed the field work and found herself drawn to studying global climate change. At some point, her interests narrowed to water and eventually to lakes. Having grown up around lakes, this seemed like probably a natural progression, but she says it took a while for her to get there. She's continued her polar research, but these days heads south to Antarctica to study the permanently frozen dry valley lakes. Back in Wisconsin, she's especially interested in water quality issues, and her work is geared toward achieving cleaner lakes throughout the state. All right, here's your trivia question for Hillary. When Hillary was little, like all of us, she had to occasionally fill out those forms that ask for your birth date, hometown, other sorts of personal information. When it came to race, she always answered other, because A, her parents told her she was 100% Irish, and she should never forget that. <laughs> B, she thought Caucasian meant she was from some sort of a part of Asia. Or she was always a rebel, and she just wanted to mess around with her hometown census data. So do we have a vote for Irish, a vote for Caucasian, not knowing what it meant, or that she was a rebel? She did not know what Caucasian meant. <laughs> no idea. <laughs> I didn't learn until very late in life what Caucasian meant. Um, 
Now, now, seeing the forms in Wisconsin, though, they just say white, which makes way more sense to me. Um, but no, you know, no one explained to an elementary school child what Caucasian meant. But, so I, and I grew up in a very Caucasian town, so I messed up all of the census data from that entire city, I'm pretty sure. Um, so as Susan said, um, I've worked, I study lakes in a lot of cold places. Um, I've worked in both poles, uh, in Norway, in Wisconsin. Um, so it, it seems natural that at some point um, to become interested in this problem of road salt runoff into lakes and what chloride contamination might be doing to our fresh waters. And as much as we think we use a lot of road salt in Wisconsin, where I grew up, we used tons of road salt. You know, you'd come home in the winter and your pants would have these white stains up the legs um, because there'd just be puddles of salt everywhere. Um, and you know, you just didn't even bother wearing leather shoes because they would just they'd be destroyed. Um, so, you know, this is this has been a problem that everyone's experienced. It's been going on for you know, we started salting roads in the 1940s. Um, so this isn't a new problem, but I think people are starting to think about it from an environmental and especially a freshwater point of view. You know, what is all this road salt that we're putting down doing to our lakes? So, hoping to just talk briefly about salts and chloride in general, give you a little background on you know why. Sodium chloride is kind of interesting. Um, what it's doing to our lakes, what we're seeing here in Wisconsin, in the Northwoods, down in Madison, um, and what we're seeing you know, more globally. Um, and then you know, just touching on what are the options, what can we do? I mean, we all like to drive fast and drive easily. Um, we appreciate when our roads are clear. Um, but you know, maybe, maybe can there can be a better balance between some of these environmental problems and public safety and efficiency. Um, so in Wisconsin, we're blessed with fresh water. It's everywhere. It, you're, you'd be hard pressed to find a spot in the state where you're less than you know, 20 miles from a lake or a river. Um, and we take that for granted for the most part, that we have abundant clean water. Um, you know, globally, that's rare. Um, lakes make up 0.007% of all water on Earth. Um, most of that water is in the ocean. 97% of uh, the water globally is in our oceans. And you know, when we talk about salty water, usually we're referencing the ocean, right? That's like our known body of salty water. Um, and the amount of salt in the ocean is about uh, 35 grams per liter. So this pint glass is about half a liter, so there'd be like 18 grams of salt per pint glass in the ocean. And most of that salt is sodium chloride. So it's table salt. Uh, it's what we're familiar. It's what we put down as road salt for the most part. Um, and the ocean is about 90% about of that salt is sodium chloride. And what's unusual about it is that nothing really uses sodium and chloride. There are these two ions that just stick around in water because species um, aren't interested in using them. Um, they don't precipitate. They don't form back into salt very easily. You'd have to evaporate about 90% of the ocean for it to form salt again, um, which has happened over time. Um, millions, you know, hundreds of millions of years ago, this whole region was an ocean, and it evaporated and left giant salt deposits. Um, there's still giant salt mines in um, east of, like the eastern Great Lakes Basin, so in Michigan, there's, there's massive salt mines, and that's where, we, that's where we get a lot of the salt that we consume. Um, Wisconsin and Minnesota, most of that salt dissolved over time just from groundwater and other, other water flushing it out. Um, but most of that sodium and chloride just it sticks around in the ocean. If you think about the fact that there's other ions, there's calcium's really abundant, but things in the ocean are using calcium. They're taking it up, they're making shells with it, uh, they're making coral. Um, so you don't see a lot of calcium in the ocean. And so this problem of sodium and chloride just sticking around is, is not just a, you know, not just happening in the ocean, it's happening in the terrestrial environment too. So we put salt into water, it dissolves, and it stays dissolved, and it stays in the water. Um, eventually, it's going to be flushed into rivers and lakes and into the ocean, but depending on where you are, that could take you know, millions of years for that to happen. Um, so it's unusual because we have a lot of it. There's naturally, it's an, it's an abundant element. Um, nothing uses it dissolves really easily, and it takes a whole lot of evaporation to form it back into salt. So it's one of the reasons why we see a lot of it in the environment. And 
because of these sort of two very different environments, the ocean, which is you know, 35 grams per liter of salt, and then freshwater, which we consider to naturally have almost no salt, you know, the background concentrations of these lakes in the Northwoods should, should be almost zero. Um, everything that lives in these environments is adapted to it. So we have saltwater fish, and we have freshwater fish, and they physiologically are very different. They're basically doing the opposite things to try and balance all of those ions in their body. So freshwater fish are trying to find ions. They, they have like too much fresh water, whereas fish in the ocean are doing the opposite. They're trying to get rid of all those ions. Um, and people do the same thing. You've probably seen enough movies to know that if you're stranded in, an ocean, like in the ocean on your life raft, you shouldn't drink salt water because it's going to make you more dehydrated because there's just so much salt in it. So you're better off just not drinking ocean water because um, we've adapted to deal with fresh water. Like, our bodies don't have a mechanism to balance out those ions, and animals are the same way. You know, there are some fish, like salmon, that we know live in the ocean, and then they, they, you know, they, they migrate into rivers. And to adapt, they actually have to switch how their body deals with ions, and that's really unusual. For the most part, organisms have adapted to one environment or the other. And so thinking about too much salt, in fresh waters means that we're just sort of stressing out all of everything living in that, that aquatic ecosystem. So it would be the same thing if all of your water started becoming slowly saltier. At a certain point, you couldn't deal with that amount of salt, and your body would um, just not have a way of dealing with it, even though at low concentrations, you know, you're, you're, you're going to be fine. Um, and that's not too far off. We're seeing increasing salt in our drinking water. Um, and that's, that's been increasing over time as well. So most people don't have a good sense of what defines fresh water. I mean, even the, the saltiest water around here is still less salty than the ocean. Um, but there are guidelines. So the EPA says that the chronic uh, threshold for chloride in water is 230 milligrams per liter. Okay, so they have this one number. It's 230 milligrams per liter. They say anything above that number, you're going to have problems. Anything below that number, you're going to be fine, which doesn't really make sense. It doesn't make you know, not having a, a cutoff for, for any kind of contaminant like that isn't realistic. It's sort of more of a, a linear um, scale where the more you add, the worse it's going to get. It's kind of like drinking alcohol, you know. Like there's not, you don't have like a three beers is going to put you over the limit. So it just slowly ramps up and all of a sudden you have a problem. Um, got to sleep it off and you'll be fine, but um, with salt, sort of the same way. But the, the EPA says 230, and that's from, from lab, uh, laboratory experiments, you know, seeing what happens at different concentrations. So um, I have my um, five-gallon bucket of nothing here. Um, so 230 milligrams per liter. Any guesses, if I filled this five-gallon bucket, bucket with water, how much salt I'd have to add to make it 230 milligrams per liter. Any guesses on how much salt? Pounds. Seeing some handfuls out there. A gallon. So to make this five gallon bucket of water 230 milligrams per liter, which is the threshold for sort of chronic salinity problems, it's one teaspoon of salt. Okay? So very little salt will pollute a lot of water. And when you're thinking about road salt, you know, you're not measuring road salt in teaspoons, you're measuring road salt in gallon buckets. So, you know, you go into any business and they've got a, a five-gallon bucket of road salt at their door, and they're, you know, throwing that salt down uh, pretty heavily. Um, so thinking about how much one teaspoon can pollute, a five-gallon bucket itself can pollute a lot. And then when we're thinking about this problem at a state level, you know, we're talking about tons of salt every winter. Um, and so that's, that's why this has become a problem. We use tons of road salt every year. And you see it in the news. You, uh, you can open basically any newspaper between the months of December and March in Wisconsin or in Minnesota, and there will be an article about road salt. Um, and there's articles because it's damaging to the environment, it's damaging to infrastructure, the billions of dollars that we spend repairing roads and bridges because of corrosion um, is excessive. Um, it's, 
it's becoming more of a problem um, as we increase road density. Um, urbanization is as just it, this is becoming more prevalent. Um, so it's it's been in the news a lot. There was a, someone sent me an article a couple weeks ago from uh, a business owner up here who who had a, has a well problem as well as 900 milligrams per liter of chloride. Um, that is well beyond the level at which you can taste chloride at. And if you're a business trying to use water to make things with, if you're a brewery or a coffee house, uh, you can't make good beer or good coffee with salty water. You can't extract coffee with salty water because the water already has so many ions in it, it can't extract the coffee ions that you actually want to be drinking. Um, so the prob you know, this causes problems for businesses, they're gonna, you know, breweries have sophisticated filtering that they have to put in to deal with that. Um, and that's becoming more of a problem um, all around the state. And there, don't get me wrong, there are ways that water can naturally have chloride. Um, you, if you evaporate a lot of water, you're gonna leave the salts behind. And that's the reason the Great, Lalt, the Great Salt Lake in Utah is salty, uh, is because of evaporation. But in Wisconsin, that's, that's just not the case. We don't have naturally salty water here. Uh, the water flushes out too quickly. There's a lot of rain, a lot of snow melt. There's a couple lakes that have some salty water in the bottom because they don't mix, but it's very rare. The background concentrations for, for lakes and rivers up here should be you know, a couple milligrams per liter. Um, and we've seen lakes increase you know, 50, 100 times that concentration. And for the most part, road salt sort of the elephant in the room, um, but water softeners can play a really big role in chloride concentrations. Um, in cities like Madison or Minneapolis, they probably contribute about half of the total chloride. Um, so you're dumping you know, bags of, of water softener salt into your water softener, and that strips calcium from your, your drinking water, and that effluent, that calcium chloride, just then gets flushed downstream. So um, wastewater treatment plants have to deal with that, um, and they they just they can't take it out of the water. It's economically infeasible, and so it just gets put downstream um, with all of the wastewater. So water softeners uh, could play a huge role. In some areas, depending on the industry, um, you can have industrial brines as well. Uh, but for the most part, here we're talking water softeners and road salts. Um, and what we've seen is that we're seeing lakes and rivers just increase over time. And it depends where you are in Madison. Um, if you've been to Madison, the city's built around a couple big lakes. They've increased about 50 to 100 times the background concentration. And in Wisconsin, we sort of pride ourselves on being the home for limnology. We think we studied lakes for a long time. And what that grants us is these long-term data sets where we can see what lakes used to be. So we have data from the 1940s that shows that these lakes used to be, you know, one milligram per liter and now there are 100, um, and that's pretty rare. Um, we usually don't have great data that goes back that far, and so it's hard to prove that these, these changes are happening. But we have that data in Wisconsin, um, and we have um, hundreds of those kind of data sets globally, and so we can look at how widespread a problem this is. Um, and doing that work, it's basically a problem everywhere from Minnesota to Maine. You just take this whole stretch of the Midwest and the Northeast, and it's happening everywhere. Uh, I did a big study where I looked at globally lakes, how, what was driving some of these trends. And in that 10 state region, if you have a road near a lake, there's a very high chance that it's got a chloride problem. Um, and we looked at lakes in Europe and take a country like Sweden, it's got a lot of lakes, it's got a lot of snow, they have no chloride problems. And it just comes down to the fact that they don't really use road salt. They plow the roads, they drive slowly, um, they don't assume any liability when it comes to slipping and falling. They kind of just assume that's part of winter. Um, and so the, 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 there are you know, examples out there of places that have similar climates that are dealing with things differently. Um, so that's something to think about for you know, how we can deal with this problem. Um, the good news is that the chloride concentrations aren't at the point where it's killing off the entire ecosystem yet. Uh, but there are problems. Um, one being that we're starting to have problems with our, with our drinking water. Um, in a lot of wells in the entire state, we're seeing chloride concentrations that you can start tasting. Um, and that's an economic problem for cities. 
You know, for a city, it costs mil you know, tens of millions of dollars to drill a new well. Uh, it's a problem for private citizens to have to drill their well deeper, especially when they're not the ones putting chloride on their, you know, on their lot. They just happen to be beside a major highway. Um, and cities are trying now to, to pre be preventative. You know, we're at concentrations that we can still deal with, so we're at the point in time where we can deal with this problem before it gets serious, before we have to take those next steps. Um, and one of the ways we're dealing with that is just we need to use less road salt. So as I said with uh, this bucket example, the amount of salt that you need for a 12-foot driveway is about a cup of road salt. So that cup is going to be just as effective as using an entire five-gallon bucket of road salt. Um, and if we scale that up to roads and parking lots, you know, we can probably use 10 times less road salt and be just as safe. We can concentrate on major highways and maybe not so much on parking lots where, you know, we you just naturally have to drive slowly anyway. Um, most parking lots would probably be fine if it just got plowed. Um, and the D Department of Transportation has scaled back a lot, um, and most people haven't seen a change in, in public safety. Um, it's a lot now on the sort of the private side of things where I think we can make a lot of change. Um, so cities and townships and counties have done, have done a lot of work scaling back. Um, there's a lot better technology these days. They're using a way more advanced spreaders that are calibrated. The amount of salt that comes out of the back of these spreaders changes based on the speed of the truck. So if they're going 50 miles per hour, you know, they use less than if they're going 50. Um, they've used really elaborate GIS computer models to optimize their plow routes. Um, they look at the weather forecast. They know if it's below 15 degrees Fahrenheit, salt's not going to work. Um, they know on a day like today, it's April. That sun's really high in the sky. As soon as it comes above the horizon, it's going to start melting. So a morning like today, I was out at 8 a.m. driving, and the roads were covered in snow. I was driving like 45 miles per hour. Three hours later, came back the same road, bone dry. I was driving 65 miles per hour. And just making that adjustment based on time. They didn't need to salt. The sun just came up. But you know, in December, that's, gonna, that's not going to work. The sun's too low. It's not going to melt. Maybe you do have to go out and put down road salt. So trying to optimize both the technology, the climate, um, knowing what's coming. We're pretty good at predicting snow these days. Um, so going out before a storm and, and pre-wetting the roads is really effective uh, for salt management. But it really it comes down to you know, putting salt in the right place, prioritizing where we actually need it, um, putting it down at the right time. So before a snowstorm, um, in times of the year where the sun's not going to be effective, um, and using the right amount. So not over salting. Um, I was at, was at Menards a couple weeks ago buying some lumber, and their salt truck came by, and it just it sprayed me with salt. And I don't know if they knew who I was, and they were just like <laughs> finding out, just pelting me. And then it came back and did it again. And I, was, I mean, it was the amount of salt that, that truck just put just on me physically would have been enough for like my entire driveway. Um, and you know, contractors. I've talked to a lot of contractors, and they're in this tough dilemma because they're incentivized to use more salt. The more salt they use, the more they get paid, and that's how contracts usually work for them. And they also get calls from their, you know, the businesses saying, like, I want my parking lot clear at 9 a.m. because no one's going to come shop here if it's not clear. So as citizens, you know, we can make a difference by speaking up. You know, we, the stores we shop at, making it known that you know, we're still going to go get groceries if you plow your lot. You know, we can wear boots. We don't need to be bone dry. Um, you know, not to have people be grossly neg negligent, but um, there is sort of a, a middle ground between us as private citizens and what we're willing to, to take and letting, you know, especially business owners, know that. Um, there's a lot of resources out there. Wisconsin has a great website called Wisconsin SaltWise um, that has a lot of these same facts that I've been telling you about. Um, and then just thinking twice about whether or not you know, we need to use road salt. And I think education's a big, a big part of that. Hopefully, you've learned a little bit from tonight and I'm you know, happy to take questions. I've talked to a lot of Department of Transportation and, and streets uh, employees over the last year. So I hope at this point I could field a lot of road questions, even though I'm a limnologist. Um, but you know, the big question as a limnologist that we still have is what it's doing to the aquatic ecosystems. We know that 
as we add salt, we stress everything that's living in that environment. Some species are better able to deal with that stress. Um, the big concern is that invasive species are going to be better suited to deal with that stress because a lot of them come from environments that are um, more salty. And so, I mean, invasive species are already, they're able to get here and invade. They're already, they're pretty good at adapting to new conditions. Um, and so when we start, you know, increasing the, the salt concentration 100 times, you know, we're probably making it a whole lot worse off for those native species than the invasive species. So um, that's going to, you know, be a problem for these environments as well. But, you know, we're still trying to figure out what is that, what are those concentrations where we really do start seeing harm? Is in lakes we have sort of a long, steady increase in chloride, whereas in rivers and streams we get these big spring pulses. I mean, there's cities, the city of Toronto, in the spring, its rivers are the same solidity as the ocean. I mean, it is just, you... People, re people release like aquarium fish and they're just, they're fine. They're happy. They're swimming around in these Toronto rivers. Um, and, you know, the city of Toronto is getting its drinking water from Lake Ontario. So it's, it doesn't have a human health impact yet. But, you know, here in Wisconsin, we're about, you know, 37% of people in Wisconsin get their drinking water from surface water. Most of those people are in the city of Milwaukee. Almost everyone else gets their drinking water from groundwater. Um, and... Everywhere from right around here to Madison, we're seeing these problems in groundwater wells. Um, we have very shallow groundwater. Um, the chloride concentrations have gone up remarkably quickly. Um, and there's, there's no good way to get rid of that other than wait and, you know, over, you know, 10 to 100 years, the, the rain will infiltrate and wash it out. Um, but if we don't change what we're doing now, you know, we're going to have to start figuring out different drinking water sources. So, um, that's you know probably the biggest concern for most people. Um, so I'm gonna stop there. I will say, oh, one thing I did wanna note, because I was gonna ask this, is the state of Wisconsin uses about half a million tons of salt per year. Um, and that's just the, the, the state level. Uh, people estimate it's about double that for all salt. So that's all like the private, private parking lots and sidewalks. So about a million tons per year. Um, and a, salt, a, a ton of salt costs, um, about seventy dollars, um, so seven seventy million dollars is spent just on road salt a year. So, if we can scale that back, we could use those thirty-five million dollars to pave the roads, or I don't know, other infrastructure projects, replace the bridges that we've corroded. Um, so there's lots of potential there too, to, as like cost savings as well. So. Alternatives. Mm -hmm. What are alternative treatments that will still melt the ice or keep us safe on the roads? Yeah. So the 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 thing about salt is it's super effective and it's really cheap. So I say it's seventy seventy dollars a ton, or sorry, seven yeah seventy dollars a ton. But it's that's still you know ten times cheaper than your next best alternative. Um, so what people are mostly moving towards is instead of using rock salt. Uh, it's using brine, so they, they mix rock salt with water um, in big tanks and spread it as liquid. And what that enables um, to do is, one, it uses, it actually uses less salt um, because a lot of that brine is water. Um, the rock salt doesn't hit the road and bounce off. It actually sticks to the road. Um, and so they're able to use a lot less. Um, it's still sodium chloride, um, but they can re just reduce that total volume. Um, people are experimenting with adding different things into that brine. Uh, so the one that people have heard a lot about is beet juice. Um, and what beet juice does is it, it's sticky, and so it helps the brine stick to the road, so it's even more effective. And the problem with beet juice and other sort of like organic uh, products is that they're, um, is that organisms love to use it as an energy source. Um, so beet juice has a lot of carbon in it, and microbes go crazy for it. And in biologists refer to this uh, as biological oxygen demand. And so if something has a really high BOD, it's sucking up all the oxygen really quickly. And so if beet juice has this problem of ramping up the BOD because um, it's providing this food source, um, so it can actually be really bad for rivers um, and lakes because it, it creates this oxygen problem. And so Wisconsin DOT has actually just like, said they're not going to use it because there's enough evidence that it's, you're, you're causing a different environmental problem by using it. 
Um, and then a lot of the other alternatives still have chlorides in them, so all the like beet or all the uh, like cheese brine and pickle brine and all these other brines still have uh, chloride. It might just be that they're cheaper than road salt or rock salt because they're usually just thrown away. Um, so there isn't there aren't great alternatives to effectively melting. Um, it's just better technology and ways of putting down sodium chloride so far is what most people are sort of gearing towards. Um, yeah. So if, the, if, if salt water is defined as 230 milligrams per liter, yeah. uh, how much is in Lake Mendota? How much is in that lake out there? Yeah. How much is in our groundwater here? So uh, not, none of the lakes that I've looked at in Wisconsin are above 230 milligrams per liter. Um, Mendota is, is 50. Lake Wingra in the city of Madison is 100. Um, most lakes up here uh, are still below 10. Uh, they should be well below, you know, one. Uh, Sparkling Lake is 12, I think. Uh, Trout Lake is two or three milligrams per liter. Um, you do see pulses in rivers, though, that are, are way above that. Uh, you'll see pulses in rivers that are one gram per liter, four grams per liter. Um, someone just asked me, a reporter asked me to look up some Milwaukee data the other day, and the rivers in Milwaukee were like four or five, milli or four or five grams per liter. So four to four to 5,000 milligrams per liter in the spring. You know, these big pulses. Um, groundwater, the article that was on the, like, Hoagies Doggies stand was 900 milligrams per liter in their groundwater well. So well above um, those thresholds. Um, the highest well in Madison is 135. So below 230, but getting up there. Um, and that's a well that you know, serves a lot of people. It's like a, you know, it's a it's a big industrial well. Um, so uh, there's there's a lot of wells that are above that 230. Um, if you're interested in groundwater data, just in general, there's the Wisconsin Extension has a really great groundwater viewer. Um, if you just Google Wisconsin groundwater viewer, um, it'll be their first hit on Google, and you can it shows all the private well data from the entire state uh, for about eight different contaminants. So chloride is one of them. And you can just click on chloride. And you can see all the well data for the entire state. Um, you can look at nitrate or arsenic or your contaminant of choice. But you will see that there's private, there's lots of private wells around the state that are above that. Um, and centered in, you know, in those, you could just draw the interstates like right along those regions of high chloride. Um, you know, Appleton and the Eau Claire, those in Madison and Milwaukee all just pop right out. Where do I go to get my well tested? Oh, that's a, so the. I'm in Rhinelander. Yeah. Um, the DNR does some testing. Um, does anyone up here know a great answer to that question? Where, where you would, the UW Extension? Um, be the person to contact? Yeah, I, that's a great question. I should have a better answer for that. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's definitely worth testing. Um, it's, uh, yeah. Is it, is it on? Yep. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I have a question, um, perhaps uh, more specific, about research and ability to sense uh, chlorine. We have, I, I've been involved in a number of situations where roads are right next to the lake. Mm -hmm and I've uh, consulted other uh, researchers. And uh, uh, talk a little bit about your ability to measure the salt, you know, kind of before and after. Mm -hmm. And could you, uh, and I've been told we have a big watershed, so we're continually told that we couldn't possibly hmm. ever establish that the salt concentration has gone up as a result of road salt, but it's from other stuff. So I'm curious about what yeah. your sensi sensitivities might be in terms of doing a research project. Yeah, that, I mean, that's an interesting conclusion that your watershed would be too big for that to be a problem. Um, you know, I, as I mentioned, there are other sources of chloride, but uh, in a lot of regions, especially in the northern half of the state, road salt is by far the main cause of that. So I think you could, 
you know, depending on the data you had, you could make some pretty conclusive conclusions, I think, on what the sources would be looking at that watershed. Um, you know, we all, there are, you know, there's watersheds range in size, but, you know, even the biggest watersheds in Wisconsin are, you know, are still medium sized. Um, so you can probably figure out where that source is coming from. Um, in terms of measuring chloride, I mean, part of the problem is that for a long time, no one measured chloride because it was this benign ion that nothing uses and no one cared about it. Um, and so there isn't, for the most part, a lot of good uh, historical data because um, it, it was a laboratory measurement. Um, we actually benefited a lot from the, the acid, all the acid rain research. So for acid rain, the problem was sulfate. So a lot of people went out and measured sulfate. And tr the traditional way of measuring chloride uh, is to run it on an ion chromatograph like in a laboratory. And usually you run sulfate and chloride at the same time. So everyone's going out measuring sulfate and they measure chloride because you just measure them both. Uh, and so we, the, all the chloride researchers have benefited a lot from that historical data. And so we do have some good background data on chloride, but for the most part it was kind of a you know, complicated sample because you have to take it, take it back to a lab and run it. Um, there, the way that most, I'd say, um, like lake organizations and people who are concerned about changes measure chloride is just by measuring conductivity of water. So um, the electrical conductivity of water is um, a much easier measurement. You can get a pretty cheap conductivity meter online. If you're into DIY, you can make one. Um, there's YouTube videos on like how to make a conductivity meter. Um, but it's just measuring the total ions in the water. Um, and that should be really low here naturally. And most places, the only thing that's going to make that go up is chloride. Um, you know, we're not, we don't have like an acid rain problem. We're not, we don't have sulfate um, being deposited all the time. So uh, a lot of lake associations have purchased just a cheap chloride meter and they, you know, take, you just put it in the water and it tells you the conductivity, sorry, cheap conductivity meter. You just put it in the water and it tells you the conductivity. And so you can just, you know, see if that's changing over time. You can see if it's higher in the rivers or if you get these spring pulses. Um, and that's a lot, a lot cheaper and easier way than actually measuring the chloride concentration itself. Um, but you can, you know, through the DNR or Wisconsin Extension, potentially get a chloride measurement as well. And then you can sort of compare the two to know what, what your conductivity measurement means. Um, but that's, that's the route that most people um, who are interested in monitoring their own system take. Is, is measuring conductivity uh, instead of chloride. We have a question online. Oh. Yeah, this came from the library. Uh, do you know the change in chloride levels in the Great Lakes over the last 50 years? Yeah, so the, it's amazing. The Great, like, as big as the Great Lakes are, they have had changing chloride. Um, they've increased, I, so they've all, they're all different. Like, just like any Great Lake problem, Superior's the best and Lake Erie's the worst. Like that's. <laughs> Any problem you have in the Great Lakes, like that's just a surefire good guess, because um, Lake Erie is just so much smaller. Um, Lake Superior has gone up a couple milligrams per liter. Um, Lake Erie, I think, more like 30 to 40. But what was really interesting in the Great Lakes, especially in uh, Lake Michigan, Erie, and Ontario, was that um, there was a huge decrease in chloride after the Clean Water Act in the 1980s. So they were all increasing. And then 1980, the, the Clean Water Act came around and they dropped like half of what they were. And then they've kind of been increasing slowly again. But there, the, the reason why is there's a, there's a ton of industrial brines, especially from uh, like the Indiana contaminant pool that kind of comes out of Gary, Indiana, into Lake Michigan. Um, and when they tried to clean those rivers up, um, you know, they had less industrial runoff. And so they were able to decrease the chloride Pretty, it was pretty dramatic that what the effect the Clean Water Act had on chloride in the Great Lakes. Um, and that had an, you know, an effect downstream. There's lots of industries all around Lake Erie and Lake Ontario. Um, and then since then, it's, it has been sort of slowly increasing again from, most people think, primarily road salt. Um, water softeners are not an issue in the Great Lakes Basin because almost everyone in the Great Lakes Basin is drinking Great Lakes water. So it's soft, and you don't need to use a water softener. So they don't have the same water softener problems that um, 
those of us who aren't drinking Great Lakes water uh, have to deal with. So it's mostly road salt um, since we've solved a lot of the industrial runoff problems. Yeah. You started off by talking of a country, what was it that uh, has no liability? Oh, Sweden? Sweden. Yeah. Um, and there's probably other countries, Scandinavian, yeah. that are similar politics or um, uh, rules, mm -hmm. and people live with it. Um, is other than us saying to a business, yeah. uh, we prefer that you don't salt your parking lot, yeah. they'll be happy to hear that, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, are we, do you think this country could ever go to a no liability mindset? Ooh. Uh, and are we, are we saving a lot of lives? Is yeah. rock, does salt save a lot of lives yeah. or just we I mean, should slow down? So, yeah, there's, so there's a few things there. I think salt does save a lot of lives because we drive really fast. Um, you know, if, if we had, you know, I, you know, I was driving this morning to Rhinelander Roads were super snowy. I'm in my two-wheel drive, little compact car. You know, just knowing it's a situation that if I lived up here, I would not own that vehicle. I would own something with all-wheel drive, and I'd probably put snow tires on my car. But yet, I, you know, I was, I was doing that. I was, being, I was driving very safe speed because of that. Um, so it's, you know, you're, if we didn't use road salt, I think we would just act differently in general. Um, the, there's, there's sort of two things that are sort of tied together. One is regulation, and one is liability. There's no regulation on, on road salt at all in the entire continent. Um, you can use as much as you want. Like you, could, you could put down 100 tons of road salt in the Monaco Brewery parking lot, and you would not be in trouble. Like you, so there's not, and you know, regulation's a touchy issue when it comes to regulating anything. Um, and it's not been regulated because People like, you try to just use common sense rules of, you know, why would someone waste their money on road salt and just dump it everywhere, right? So it's an economic, it's, you know, the, the free market should probably balance out the fact that you probably shouldn't buy too much, but um, the, so the liability issue then comes in is that people are oversalting because they think they're liable for slip and falls. Um, and there's a lot of perceived liability. It varies state to state. There's not a lot of case law that supports having this much liability. Um, there's, been, there's been very few slip and fall cases that have gone to court, most people just settle because it's cheaper. Um, but that lawyer still costs more than a bag of salt. So um, New Hampshire right now is trying to put, push through legislation at the state level to, to make uh, basically businesses not liable or, and contractors not liable. So contractors assume a lot of liability as well um, and they have a lot of insurance to cover that. Um, so they're trying to push through state legislature that, legislation that says that you know, as long as you're not wholly negligent on clearing your sidewalk or parking lot, you're not going to be liable. Um, Minnesota's trying to do something similar. Um, so there's going to be at least some precedent as to whether or not that goes through. Um, you know, comparing to other countries is hard because they're just, we're very litigious in general. Um, and there, are, there is a lot more regulation environmentally in Europe. Um, and so most places you just, you as a private citizen cannot use road salt. Like the city can use it in, you know, in certain circumstances, but that's all that's allowed. Um, so, you know, I don't, it's just, they have different environmental regulation, a lot more regulation. Um, there were countries in Europe that had road salt problems in the 70s and 80s and then just like just stopped using it. I've seen huge improvements in their lakes. Um, and so there, there's also examples of you know, seeing that improvement. The nice thing about chloride is it doesn't stick around in the environment um, the way that other contaminants might. So we hear a lot about contaminants like mercury that sort of stay in the food web. Um, they're just sort of cycled in the lake. You know, phosphorus kind of does that too. But chloride, because nothing's using it, uh, has the potential to just be flushed downstream eventually. So it's an environmental problem that has a relatively easy fix, which is you just stop putting so much in and it'll eventually flush out naturally. Um, so, and there's examples in other countries where we've seen that, that, that fix work. Um, so the, the liability and regulation issues, I think we'll see examples of that in the next few years from other states. Um, there's, um, you know, in, there's provinces in Canada where you, 
legally have to have snow tires between December and March. You know, and those are places where, you know, the entire province is cold in winter. You know, in Wisconsin, it's harder because you're also dealing with a state that has this huge climate variation. So the, the climate that we get in southern Wisconsin is very different than the climate you get in northern Wisconsin. So coming up with a regulation that works for, like, that different climate uh, is difficult, too. Um, and the way we put salt down is different as well because of that. So uh, it's challenging. Um, the good news is, is that the, the state DOT is very aware of this problem. Uh, you know, they, want, they would love to save money on buying road salt. Um, and so they're doing, they're doing a lot recently uh, to, to improve. Um, and their practices and use less salt. So um, I think we're, we're going to see less salt use in general in Wisconsin. Um, from the on the public side of things. Question way back here. Yeah. What about sand as an alternative? I yeah. mean, maybe not on interstates, but sand's always worked on smaller roads, particularly close to lakes. Yeah, I mean, it it, um, it does work really well a lot. I think the DOT is starting to use more as well. They use um, like a 95% sand, 5% salt mixture a lot of places too, and just like that 5% salt does a lot. Um, it's What's hard is it's so variable on who's clearing what roads. So um, in Madison, the city clears a lot of the roads, and the city only salts the main roads. So it just doesn't, it has, it, and that's new. It's in the last couple of years. It just doesn't salt any of the smaller roads. They're like, we're going to sand it, and uh, you can, you know, drive slowly down your street until you get to a main road, and we'll salt that one. Um, whereas the county takes care of the really big roads in the city, so the, the sort of major uh, highways that run through Madison, and the, the county uses probably five times the amount of salt per lane mile that the city does. I mean, it's noticeable, the difference between what the county takes care of and what the city takes care of. Um, and so you can tell that different people are running those programs. The people in Madison know they have a groundwater problem. The mayor's told them to not use so much salt because they don't want to drill new wells. They're using 300 pounds per lane mile. The county's using 1,000 pounds per lane mile. Um, Dane County uses the most salt of any county in the entire state, um, like double. Um, I mean, we have a lot of people, but we don't, like, don't have that many people. Um, and so knowing who takes care of what road's important to you. Someone this morning asked me, they're like, you know what, I live on a road that's pretty much like me and my neighbor, and the you know, township comes through and salts it. I'm like, what if we don't want it salted? What happens if like my neighbor and I you know, don't want our road salted. We live right on a lake. You know, we're fine with just putting sand down. And I didn't have a good answer to that question. I didn't know if you can go to your township and say, you know, we don't want our road salted. I don't know, you know, who to talk to because every jurisdiction has someone who's, who's different in charge of that. But, you know, that's something to think about, especially in, you know, more, I guess, rural regions where some roads don't have very many people on them. And if those people all agree that they don't want road salt put down, you know, maybe they can make a change in their, in their road. And that's going to directly affect their lake. So um, that's like one possibility as well. Uh, but yeah, but sand is great. And it's, for the most part, pretty environmentally friendly. There's some places where you get, uh, like, turbidity and uh, just the, like, clarity issues in water because you just have too much sand all at once. But that's pretty rare for the most part. The amount of sand we're putting down is still pretty minimal. I mean, it's a sandy... We have a lot of sand naturally, too. So that tends to be in places where naturally there's not a lot of sand and you're adding a lot. We have a question online. Yeah, talked about Minnesota, but what about other western states regarding salt use? So yeah, once you get west of Minnesota, the salt use goes way down. Um, they, the climate's just a lot different. It's a lot drier. Uh, the snow tends to sublimate, evaporate really quickly. You don't get a lot of ice. Um, and so a lot of times we use, we use a lot of road salt because we get a lot of icy conditions. We get these temperatures that hover right around freezing and they flip back and forth. Um, and salt is really effective between, you know, 30 and 15 degrees Fahrenheit. And so if you're in places, you know, out west, you're up high, it just, it just stays colder than 15, it's really dry, road salt's not going to do a lot. Um, and then they also use things like studded tires and chains that are, you know, illegal most places in the Midwest because, because again, we have these temperatures that fluctuate. We go from snowy road to dry road daily, it seems like right now. 
Um, and so, you know, yeah, it'd be great to have studded tires in the morning, but then you're going to tear up your road in the afternoon. And so, you know, they're not allowed here for that reason. Um, so there, the climate has a huge effect on, on where that shift in road salt use happens. So for the most part, it's, it's like Minnesota, Wisconsin, a little bit of Iowa, down to, you know, parts of Illinois and then just east. And in Canada, it's the same thing. It's Ontario, Quebec, Maritimes, but the west, you know, Manitoba through BC just doesn't use a lot because the climate is just, stay, it actually just stays too cold in the winter for it to be useful. Um, so there's, you know, people are like, oh, why can't we just be like Montana? But it's, it's, that's tougher than it, it seems just because our climate is, is so different, especially in the winter. Yeah. Is there any study about the degradation of the asphalt or the concrete due to salting? Yeah, so it's um, definitely, um, there's, there's been a lot of research on different types of salt too. So, uh, so I've, talked about, I've, talked, I've talked exclusively about sodium chloride because that's mostly what we use. Um, it's calcium chloride and magnesium chloride are other salts that are, um, they're, they work at lower temperatures, they just cost a lot more, but they tend to be actually be a lot more corrosive. So uh, most people, cities who have experimented with calcium chlorides just see way more corrosion and, and it's worse for the asphalt um, as well. Um, but there's, there's a remarkable amount of engineering studies that take place with uh, like types of salt, types of plows, uh, types of traffic, um, where they, they look at all of these different combinations of, you know, if we use these types of plows and we have this many 18 wheelers over top of it per hour, and the weather's doing this, you know, what's the best outcome? But, um, so it's, sodium chloride is actually one of, I guess, like the better chemicals for corrosion, and, but it's, uh, it's still damaging, obviously, like we see it on our cars. Um, but other, other salt combinations seem worse. So, um, yeah. Has there been any studies on, on lake specifics? Uh, and I'm thinking in our area mm -hmm. where you said, you know, our, our concentration of salt is very, very low. But um, I'm thinking in terms of what might be happening with, for instance, the microorganisms and mm -hmm. so forth, which could be susceptible um, just because mm -hmm. of their size and so forth to, uh, yeah. to degradation as a result. Has there been any... Anything been done on that? Yeah, so there's been no, um, that's a really difficult question to assess sort of in the real world. Um, but there's been a lot of studies that have looked at sort of tank enclosures where you take a tank and you fill it with different concentrations of salt, so different tanks at different concentrations, and you have the same organisms living in each tank and you see what happens. Um, so there, there is lots of evidence that um, lots of the smaller organisms um, do suffer uh, in terms of reproduction as you get, they're just like, they're, they're, they're not as successful in reproducing as you get higher chloride concentrations. Um, and that's, you know, exacerbated in lakes with high nutrients and they've looked at it under different sort of temperature and sun conditions. Um, but it's really, it's, a, it's something that's really difficult to assess in an actual lake ecosystem um, because we don't have a good Con, you know, control, or not, it's not, it's hard to do an actual experiment in the lake. Um, so most of the studies do show that, um, well, it's a mix. I mean, there's some, there's a few species that seem to be okay at lower concentrations, and there's others that are, are more impacted. Uh, but these are, all the, almost all the research is from, like, you know, small swimming pools of, of salty water. So um, it's something that I think people are starting to think more about, which is how do we, how do we perform those experiments and understand that impact in an actual lake ecosystem. Um, so that's something that we're trying to work on right now and hopefully I have a better answer for you in, I don't know, a year, a couple years. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, we've talked about how fish respond and how humans respond to drinking water and now microbes. Mm -hmm. But what about the vegetation on the roadsides? You can roll yeah. down 51 and our trees are rusting out just like our cars. Yeah. <laughs> so that? Yeah, I mean, that is a, it's the same thing with uh, aquatic species. I mean, plants, there's some plants that deal with that salinity level better. Um, I mean, there's just like native uh, aquatic organisms. There's invasive plants 
that are like really good at dealing with salinity, and there's native plants that aren't. Uh, but you get, with plants, it's a lot more obvious because you do see that you know they're dying on the sides of roads um, from this salt spray. Um, and yeah, it's I mean with plants, it's the exact same problem. And I think we don't just like we don't have a good grasp on the impacts to biota in the lakes. I don't think we have a good grasp on a, like what's happening with a, like native aquatic plants either and how they're able to deal with it because plants can't move. So fish are pretty good at finding like the perfect place to live in a lake. You know, if there's, if some, there's a place that's really cold or pretty warm, you know, they'll find their optimum oxygen and optimum temperature and they're probably also gonna find their optimum salinity um, and they can move around and find that. So they're better able to adapt to sort of different conditions. But plants, you know, if you're a plant that's right by where a big river is dumping in a lot of chloride, you're probably going to be a lot more susceptible to um, di dying than <laughs> so like somewhere else. Yeah. On Sparkling Lake, we yeah. know that's right by the highway, right? Yeah. And it has the higher levels of it chloride. It does, yeah. So, you know, from the limnology point of view, we know that those buffers, those vegetative buffers, help with a lot of things like phosphorus. Yeah. Does it do the same thing for chlorides, or does it just kill it on its way down yeah. and then <laughs> yeah. have to keep going? It's, it's, it's probably the latter, but okay. um, it's there hasn't been a lot of work seeing how much chloride plants take up. So for the most part, uh, it seems like they don't take up a lot. Um, there, I think there's been some research with like, cattails in wetlands, seeing if those cattails are effective in actually pulling chloride out. Um, it doesn't seem like they're pulling out vast amounts, so it's probably postponing, it's making its way into the water. Um, but what those buffer strips can do is that they, it, it flattens out those pulses. So instead of you know, a huge storm putting all of the chloride in at once off the road, it just delays it. And so it might be better for the lake if you're getting a slow trickle of chloride than if you're getting these giant pulses all at once. So those buffer strips can still have an impact. And they're really helpful for a lot of other things. Um, Any other questions? Got any more online? Oh, yep. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Hold on, Steph. Oh. We got people online listening to you. Sorry. You had mentioned cattails. Yeah. Just pulling it out. Are there any other plants, vegetation that you know that is maybe beneficial to have in a restoration site that's along a highway? If Oof. You're that won't be affected by yeah, yeah. That won't be affected by salt. I mean, a lot of the native plants would be just because they are adapted to the freshwater conditions. So I don't have a great answer for you. I'm not a great plant biologist. <laughs> just put that out there. There might be people who are better at answering that. Do you, I mean, do you, Carol? Do you have any? Susan was Susan. Here. Better I kind of missed the question. Can you repeat it? Better plant species that dealing with oh, the no. right conditions? I don't know. No, I don't know. So there's, a lot, I mean, there's lots of work to be done in that realm too. Um, I think everyone's trying to, you know, it's, it's an interesting topic because it's only in the last few years where it seems like people have really taken this awareness of chloride being a contaminant. You know, prior to that, you know, it was just viewed as, you know, it, it's organic. It's we eat it. It's natural. It's, you know, but it's like anything. It's if you use too much of it, it becomes a problem. Um, and I think we're, you know, just in the last couple of years, there's been, been awareness that it is a problem. And so even the scientists are trying to catch up and figure out, you know, how that's impacting both plants and water and human health. Um, you know, for the most part, most of us can get away with drinking, you know, water that's 300 milligrams per liter. Um, but if you have hypertension or some cardiovascular issues, it can be, you know, really damaging. Um, and you know, we're still unsure what that safe level is, I think, in a lot of circumstances. So um, there's, you know, work to be done in every aspect of this problem, um, for sure. Uh, I have one more question. How far from the highway can you see the effects of salt? It depends on the watershed. So um, obviously, if you have a lake, so the, the lakes, the Sparkling Lake example is perfect. So if you drive up 51, um, Sparkling Lake is a pretty tiny lake uh, right beside the highway. Trout Lake is, I don't know, 10 times as big as Sparkling on the other side of the highway. And so um, 
they're both increasing in chloride, but sparkling is increasing a lot faster. Um, and then sort of off the road behind up, upstream Trout Lake, there's, you know, there's, there's Aliquash and Big Muskie Lake, and they're not increasing at all. We see no increase in chloride in those lakes. So they're just far enough from the road. They're what we call uh, headwater lakes, so they're, they don't have another lake that's draining into them. So if you're not by a road, you being a lake, if you're a lake and you're not by a road, um, you probably have no chloride problem, except if the water that's coming into your lake is coming from a lake or a river that is beside a road. So it kind of depends on the hydrologic conductivity. Um, we have a lot of lakes in this region that are what we call seepage lakes, so they don't have inflows. It's all groundwater fed. Um, so if that lake is not by a road, it's probably pretty, in pretty good condition. Um, but it all kind of depends on the size of your watershed, where that water's coming from. Um, if it's groundwater fed and the groundwater starts getting high in chloride, then you know you have a problem as well. So it's all, I mean, water's all connected. Um, you know, we don't have any true sort of closed, uh, closed basin lakes in this region. So the water at some point is all connected through groundwater. Um, so if, you know, we get to a point where all the groundwater has a lot of chloride in it, then we're getting more and more problems. There's a question back there too. Mary? You mentioned that there's millions of tons of salt that are on the highway. Yeah. Is there any research or practical use of trying to collect that salt in some hypersalinic area, yeah. like Sparkling Lake? I'm not going to pick <laughs> yeah. on that one, but you mentioned it a few times. Funnel. And then you can reuse it the next winter. Yeah. So you're recycling your road salt. <laughs> People have, are considering these engineering feats. It's tricky because, you know, that million tons of salts is so spread out. You know, it's difficult to try to assess how you would collect it um, because it, as I said, it dissolves in water, and so it's really hard to form it back into a salt. You need to evaporate a lot of the water. Um, and so we have so much rain and so much snow melt that, you know, trying to capture that's really difficult. Um, I will say for everyone who sees, like, a pile of salt just laying on a dry sidewalk, that you could just sweep up into a dustpan and use again. Um, cause I see that all the time and I kind of like, I wish I just, I should just have like a traveling dustpan where I just, <laughs> and I probably could sell that salt. Um, I've, I heard a talk by someone in Madison who is a landscaper for a big apartment complex downtown. And what he decided to do was to, he's got a, you know, he's, this is a giant apartment complex that has a thousand, thousand people living in it. Um, they have a, a massive water softener that goes through, you know, thousands of gallons a day. Um, and he decided to capture all the effluent. So usually how water softeners work is you add sodium chloride. It adds the sodium into the water. It strips out calcium. And the calcium chloride just gets flushed down the drain. So it gets flushed down the drain the way your, you know, any of your sanitary waste would be. So instead, he disconnected that outlet and started just collecting all that calcium chloride into tanks. And then he put that tank on his bobcat and spread it around his parking lot. Mm -hmm. So instead of purchasing, you know, this, he, he would have purchased, I don't know, a few tons of road salt probably um, over a winter to put down on, on their parking lots and sidewalks. You know, they're in downtown Madison, so they have a lot of drunk students walking around <laughs> in the snow. So they have to, you know, they have to clear their sidewalks um, for liability reasons. Um, so for him, it was economic. It was completely economic. He's like, I'm buying all this salt, and yet I'm dumping all this salt down the drain. Why don't I just collect it and use it? Um, so he's been doing that for two winters now, and it's been really effective. Calcium chloride is, will melt at a lower temperature, but it's more corrosive, so there are other problems with doing that. Um, it's, instead of sending it down the drain to the wastewater treatment plant, you're then putting it on the ground so it's going to leach into groundwater. So there's environmental consequences, but in his case, he was, he was going to be putting down road salt anyway, so he might as well just use the brine he had. So for him, in the end, he, he is using less chloride in total. So for him, it actually is beneficial environmentally and economically. Um, so that was kind of cool um, in a way of, of trying to capture salt in a different way. Um, but with roads, it's hard because 
just that runoff is so heterogeneous. Like it just is, every, like you just have runoff over all roads all the time. So capturing it would be just really tough. Um, if you could come up with some solution that, you know, there's been places that have talked about trying to use uh, like heated roads. So solar, so basically solar roads that are capturing energy and then heating themselves. And that's been done on a, you know, there's test cases that are you know, like the size of this room. Um, and that's something that people are starting to think about. It's like, well, solar is getting so cheap. Why don't we just put solar cells in roads? They can heat themselves and just melt their, their snow. So, you know, if we could dream, that would be amazing. Um, they could also light themselves. They could, you know, do a whole lot of things if we could, uh, manu you know, manufacture something like that. But um, those are, you know, something that's way in the distance. But there's no feasible means of collecting it right now, I guess is... My really long answer to that question. <laughs> yeah. The the problem having been identified, I guess I'd like to leave here tonight knowing or having mm -hmm. a sense of how soon the problem could be solved mm -hmm. if we just stopped using it or yeah. any incremental yeah. uses from so there. So it's um that's something that I've been trying to work on just personally in my research is you know, when are we gonna see these concentrations decrease depending on what we do. So um Limnologists talk about residence time of lakes all the time, and the residence time is how long it would take to flush out a lake. So every lake has a different residence time based on how much water comes into it. Um, so um, a lot of lakes up here, the residence time can be a year, can be pretty quick. Um, in Madison, like Lake Mendota, for instance, is four years. Um, and so if you, you know, stopped putting in salts and your residence time is a year, um, in that year you'd, you'd turn over your entire water body um, and, you'd, you know, you'd see at least half of that salt go away. Um, the, the big unknown is how much salt is just stored on the landscape already. So, you know, we put down one million tons of salt, but one million tons of salt doesn't immediately go into the lakes and rivers or groundwater. It's, a lot of it's probably stored in the ditch. And over time, as it rains, it's going to slowly percol percolate out. Um, so there's a, the big unknown is this, what we call legacy salt. So like how much salt is still out there? And it's the same problem we deal with with like phosphorus and nitrogen, sort of the legacy phosphorus. You know, we've been putting down fertilizer for years. How much is still out there? Um, so it's the same problem with salt. Um, theoretically, there, there shouldn't be much because, as I said, sodium and chloride dissolve and they should stay dissolved. Uh, but we know that's not truly the case. Um, so people now are starting to look at soils too and see how much salt is stored in them and that'll give us a better sense of if there's a lot, it could take longer for the, for the fresh water to recover. Um, otherwise, it should be a pretty easy calculation of just based on residence time of these systems. Um, so in Mad I mean, I'm doing this work in Madison looking at soils in the city, um, seeing how much chloride is stored in them. Um, but the same work could be done you know, in different, different areas. Um, and hopefully we can come up with, you know, we should be able to come up with that answer for, you know, most lakes in the state, basically. <laughs>